Hey there, hunters, and welcome back to the Gunner's Guild. Look, I can still make Monster Hunter content, I swear. Um, okay, so it might be 15 years too late, but I can finally review Monster Hunter Freedom Unite, which was originally released on the PSP back in 08, and I have a lot to say about the game. I won't bore you with, like, a six-hour monologue, but I do want to talk a lot about my experiences with Freedom Unite as a first-time player here in 2024. And for a small piece of background, in case you didn't know, I originally started with Monster Hunter in 3U on the 3DS, though I didn't finish it. I gave up at like HR4 because my high school brain couldn't comprehend it. But then I got into 4U and well, Monster Hunter has been my jam ever since. Though it wasn't until recently where I went back to start to play the older titles that I didn't finish or experience. Last year I did another playthrough of GU with Cats, 4U with Heavy Bowgun, and then Try and 3U gunning my way through. So last year I kind of played a lot of Monster Hunter. And while I did start Freedom Me Night last year, the whole like, you know, end of the year, New Year stuff kind of made me lost track and, you know, fall off, and I had to pick it back up. Anyway, I finally went back to experience and finish up the glorious title, Monster Hunter Freedom Unite. Because all the old school hunters say it was peak and amazing, and that it's real Monster Hunter, and I'm here to say that it's not, and that's bull. So let's dive into Monster Hunter Freedom Unite as told by someone who uses only ranged weapons, and who can actually say something negative about a game. Okay, to start with, well, let's start with the start. The beginning stages of Freedom Unite, like all Monster Hunter games, is pretty slow. Lots of gathering quests, you know the drill. But what I didn't realize here is that there are no gathering prompts in 2nd Gen. So like, I was running around looking for certain mining nodes and mushroom spots, and they really blend into the environment. And with no gathering button prompts, I run by so much stuff early on, it really made the gathering take a long time. You get used to it though, you recognize the spots and whatnot, just take a little bit of learning though. But the other thing about the early game in Gathering is that you have your village farm, like pretty much every other game, though the farm here in Pretty Me Night is a little bit different. It actually upgrades with you as you get higher hunter rates, and so it'll provide you with bugs, plants, and ore through the entire game with progressively better materials, and you pretty much always want to be using it and it's always relevant, because I don't think all the farms are like that, like some of them you just stop going to after a while. Now, I do like the Freedom Unite farm as well, though of course it's a little dated because in future generations you can stockpile resources for like 10 hunts, so you get like a big pile of items less often, but you don't have to go there after every hunt, but here in 2nd gen, you have to collect your farm items after every single hunt or you just don't get it. So you end up spending a lot of time gathering bugs and ore and such, and I think I spent like half my time in Freedom Unite here on the farm. So I can totally see why kids these days don't really like this part of the older Monster Hunter games, it doesn't really bug me all that much, it feels rewarding enough so I don't mind doing it, and I actually would like to see the farm be a bigger part of the franchise going forward with like wilds and stuff, but you know, maybe make it more customizable so you can just get, you know, stuff that you actually need, not like everything. Um, but I still really like this farm and I would like to see something like, you know, Freedom Unite's farm expanded and then, you know, add it on a little bit and then put that into wilds and then we'd be good. And there are two other village related things I wanted to point out first, uh, and that is the canteen. And dudes, I loathe the canteen in Freedom Unite. Now, no, I didn't say love. I loathe it. There is absolutely no instruction, and I had no idea what foods give what bonuses. And, like, you get more cats to cook as you progress through your village quests, but most of the time, I was just picking random cats or random ingredients, because I wasn't sure what provided what. Like, in 3rd and 4th gen, for the most part, you could just eat about anything, and you're going to get at least health and stamina, unless it was, like, unlucky food or something. But a lot of the times in Freedom Unite, you get the wrong combination and you get no bonuses at all from the canteen. And that sucks. I had to ask like three people for like how the food system works and get like a rundown on it because I couldn't figure out what ingredients were good with what and you know what cats I needed. Uh, it was just a little bit of a pain. And even now, I, I still can't reliably get specific food skills to activate. I mean, maybe I'm just retarded or it's a mess. I don't know. But either way, personally, I don't like the canteen in Freedom Unite. So I didn't want to bring that up. I'd still like for you canteen the best. And the last village thing though I did want to discuss is the granny. The old granny peddler. Here is the best and worst part about this game. Like, the best because she will sell you just about everything you need. Meats, flash bugs, materials, traps, ammo combination materials, bombs, you name it. She has like seven pages of materials and she's awesome. I love her. Granny peddler is the best. That being said, that's only the case if you have the DLC to add the extra three pages of materials that has all the good stuff like meat and bugs and stuff. 
Now, I went through almost all of high rank before realizing she was never going to cycle into the good stuff, and I had to move my game over from, you know, Freedom Unite to Portable 2G, which is the Japanese version of Freedom Unite, just because that one comes with all the DLC content, so the granny was able to hook me up. So getting through most of the game without the granny peddler, with, you know, all the extra DLC items, would have been pretty flippin' miserable. So, if anyone's thinking of playing Freedom Unite, get Portable 2G with the English patch, or the complete patch, it's worth it. Because the best item in the game, and the one that's going to save our life against pretty much every monster, is the Flash Bomb. It is so god dang OP in this game, and I would have struggled so much more if the Granny didn't sell the bugs for these things. Which, again, she only does with the DLC pack. Like, I don't think I could fight Tigrix without Flash Bombs. I really don't think I would be able to kill it. Okay, so that was kind of a lot without talking about anything specific. So, let's get into the hunting parts. Now, obviously, I only pick ranged weapons. And one of the reasons why I was told to play Freedom Unite is because, like every generation, bowguns work a little differently here. And I'll go over them a little bit more in depth in case you're wondering, but... In here, in Freedom Unite, there's a skill called Autoload, which as you can imagine, makes you autoload ammo. But unlike the terrible version in 5th gen, this one basically just means you have infinite ammo and you only have to load it in once. And that is pretty powerful. But that skill is a way off, so for now I was just dealing with standard heavy bowgun and bow for monsters that I can't maneuver around well enough, like Tigrix and Garuga. Bow is actually pretty decent in second gen, it's fairly strong, but unfortunately there's no arc shots or power shots, so really all it does is hold to charge and let go to shoot, and that's literally the entire bow kit. Sure, you can, you know, poke to do melee, but who does that, right? Now I do like the whole, like, ranged greatsword approach to bow, Old World Bow is definitely a lot more methodical, I think it's fun. Uh, in 2nd Gen it's still passable, but I definitely like 4th Gen Bow more with power shots. Well, 4th Gen is just peak gunning for everything really. Now, for the most of Pretty Me Night, I did end up using Heavy Bowgun though. Early on, normal ammo, pretty strong. Having a 12 motion value is good, but also, pellets are very strong here like they are in 3rd Gen. Pellets can magnet very well to certain monsters, but also uniquely here to second gen, pellets can hit monsters under the ground. So things like Diablos, Cephadrome, the crabs, they can all be hit while burrowed. And if you stagger them, it's kind of like a sonic bomb thing where they get stuck in the ground for a few seconds. So yeah, pellets carried pretty well, and overall I kind of enjoyed my early game gunning, especially since I could just buy all the ammo combines pretty cheaply. Oh, okay, so another thing about second gen gunning that makes it super easy for early game progression, which is typically not the case for Monster Hunter games, is that bow guns don't upgrade like normal weapons here. So typically, whenever you want to upgrade a weapon, you would craft the weapon, and then you upgrade it with, you know, either materials from that same rank or the start of the next rank, and then you upgrade it again to like a final version of it, or maybe it's just two, whatever. But with bow guns, they start at level one, and they can be upgraded up to level five with purely money. So there's no weapon upgrades like a tree. You make whatever you make is the final form of the bow gun. You can just enhance the raw of the weapon as you go. So the early game, you can dump like 5k zenny and make a bowgun that has almost high rank levels of raw, which kind of lets you demolish the early game. And this starts out as pretty busted, but this quickly stops mattering all that much, like by the time you're in high rank village or high rank hub. Like it's an interesting system, but it does end up largely become pointless because you just automatically max up your gun like as soon as you make it, so you can just enhance the raw all the way. So you might as well just get the bowguns like max upgrade already. Now as I'm going through the low rank village hunts, I've noticed a few things. One is that monsters move a lot, like they change zones every 30 seconds or so, and they're changing zones if they're not in rage, they can change zones if you shoot them, they can change zones, you know, after you've already engaged with them. And this is way faster than even like 3rd gen, and I thought they moved a lot then. Uh, and it definitely made me spend a ton of my time running around chasing monsters and guessing because I never bring paintballs because I'm an idiot. Now speaking of that, I don't like to bring paintballs and psycho serums and stuff because in 2nd gen, you don't even have a gunner pouch, so your three item pages have to cover everything. All heals, all ammo, all combines, uh, combo books, stuff like that. So by the time I was getting into like, high rank, I just didn't have space to carry them. Anyway, back to low rank. So yeah, I got lost a lot. Also, interesting in Freedom Unite, low rank has a lot of monsters and their subspecies even. Where typically you don't see very many monsters and even rare species or subspecies until high rank. So like, by the time you're in 2 and 3 star village, which is early on, you're already seeing things like Blue Kutku, Green Plesioth, Purple Gypsaros, and White Monoblos. It's kind of scary because those subspecies hit a lot harder and they're kind of a pain to deal with, especially when you have like literally no gear at all. 
But I did find that it's a really good plus for the game, and I would like to see other titles have more varied species even at low rank, rather than, you know, you fight like the same four or five monsters and never fight them again. And of course, immediately anyone and everyone will recognize that small monsters are the real menace in this game. And that never stops, ever. From the first quest up until like the final tier of hub, small monsters play a huge part in your overall stress of this game. And like, not only are they aggressive and fully ignore large monsters who just to bum rush you all the time, but they have a lot of HP too. Like in G rank, a Konga takes like eight shots of normal two to kill it. It's like a whole clip. And people always say, oh, just clear the small monsters out before you fight the large monsters. And that is a load of horseshit because small monsters respawn in like five seconds, especially the crabs, dude, fuck the crabs. And then they're so fast and they just molest you the entire freaking time. And if you don't engage the monster, then he's just gonna run off. And I'm pretty sure I've gotten hit by small monsters and killed because of them way more than large monsters. Both Fangos, Kongas, Hermitors, Vespoids, they're just aggravating. The Raptors usually aren't a huge deal, they miss you a lot and don't attack as often. But dude, small monsters, especially since I'm a gunner, not only do they hit a lot harder, but I have to waste ammo that I really can't spare. And I actually found that I prefer to do Elder Dragon quests because there aren't any small monsters during them like when the Elder Dragons are around, which feels amazing. Oh, might as well talk about those. So Elder Dragons and Premium Knight are a little interesting. They have a ton of HP, and I mean a ton. Even in like low rank village, they take like 20 minutes to kill. But a lot of the times they end up just fleeing, so you just repel them, and then you have to do the quest again. But the second time you do them, the elders already have like their parts broken and they're missing a huge chunk of HP. So they have an easier time like in the second or even the third hunt if you get to that point. But they're not designed to be killed in any single hunt, it feels like. So, I mean, you can do it, of course, but they're meant to be chased off and finished later. And I think this is a sensible take on how to approach elders, to be honest, because like in the later generations, like fourth and fifth, elders aren't that much different from standard monsters. Outside, obviously, the giant elders and final bosses like Gogmazios, Dalmador, Nakarkos, Xenojiva, Kolv, and stuff like that. But elders don't really have a huge impact on the game in the later generations and kind of lost their uniqueness to me. I feel like Freedom Unite approached the Elder Dragon fights pretty well, and I'm sure that a lot of people don't want to waste time fighting the same monster twice to get no carbs, but I don't think it would be that big of a deal to have this system return. Like, we get way too many rewards in 5th gen anyway, come on. Again, probably an unpopular opinion, but I do like that you have to chase the Elders across certain maps, times, stuff like that, like fighting them multiple times, it kind of makes them feel a bit more special. Anyway, low rank is pretty chill, not too many issues, kind of blown through the game. And then we get to the fun fights, Shen Goran and Lao Shen Lung. Oh my god. If you thought doing Lao and Jen was bad, it is awful here. This is worse than like Jen Moran and Daren Moran like in 3 and 4 you. And I swear you have to fight Lao and Shen like 8 times each throughout the entire game. Like 3 star village, 6 star village, 8 star village, 9 star village, and then again for all the hub quests. They're slow, they're boring, and they're mandatory. Like, the gear is good, I can't complain too much because, like, the flippin' Lao heavy bowgun's like the best heavy bowgun, but oh my god, it just gets old really quick. Like, the big issue is that these monsters are HP locked in the areas like they walk through, so until you get to zone 5 at the end, you can't kill them. Regardless of how much damage you do, you can't actually finish them off until they walk all the way through the map, which takes 20 minutes itself. So, minimum 20 minute hunts. You're just watching them walk, slowly walk, and turn. And it's just awful. At least the Morans are pretty engaging, lots to do there, climbing on them, dodging rocks, stopping charges, ringing the gongs, all that stuff. Those are pretty fun by comparison. Okay, so speaking of the questing too, I noticed that when I was at the end of the high rank hub, that village and hub quests are identical in Freedom Unite. Same quest names, same quest monsters, same key quests, kind of a letdown. Like, you do the exact same quests, same everything, in both village and hub so there's really not any different like there's no storyline or anything like that and you just end up not having to fight most of the roster too because they don't change anything up like none of the elder dragons kieran toaster luna kush cami they're not mandatory at all nor like any of the subspecies besides like goldian and slos of course you can go fight them but you're never directed in that way i think that was one of the cool things about like 3u was that they appointed you in quests for monsters that would give you the weapons that had the weakness to the next monster. Like you'd have to do Rathalos, and then you have to take the fire weapon to Baryoth, then you take the ice weapon to Diablos, stuff like that. And there's not really any of that going on here. I think like the only real difference was like in G2 and G3 in their final quest where you kind of need to kill Yamasukami and Ukanlos. 
Oh, okay, so I finally got auto loader, by the way, at the end of like high rank going into G rank. And boy, was I disappointed. Now, all I heard was, it's no more reloads, it's OP, it's the best thing ever. And yes, that's true, but there are a lot of downsides to auto loader. First is that it doesn't work for rapid fire ammo. So you can't toss that on a light bow gun for usage, so that kind of sucks. It also makes it so you have the worst recoil and reload. And no, you can't fix that with skills. Reload doesn't really matter because you only have to reload once. But you can't really use anything like clusters, pierce, pellets, or anything else because the reload is absolutely awful. But you can use normals and elemental ammo. Because elemental is weird in Freedom Unite. Like, it has its own recoil and reload, which is independent of other ammo. So the stats on the bowgun or your armor play no part in how fast they shoot and reload. And so autoloader does not hinder elemental ammo at all. And I honestly want to say that that's a bug. Because it makes no sense. And I don't feel like it should be that way. But it is that way, so whatever. So the only reason why autoloader is so popular and so good is because, yeah, you could just dump elemental ammo and normals. But... I was pretty sad to see it, to be honest. I wanted to use it with clusters, but that's just me, of course. And it's not even that, like, elemental ammo is bad, but it's like, I was using Pierce for, like, high rank all the way to the rest of the game. And elemental ammo is good. In fact, it's probably preferable for most matchups. So, it's like, autoloader, elemental ammo, that's great. That's why it's kind of meta. But I didn't have the combines so you know, constantly have all the elemental ammo. Uh, also, I didn't like falling back on normal twos, because when you're solving all the hub quests, like, you kind of run out of ammo pretty quick. So, I wasn't feeling it. I stuck with Pierce for, like, the entire game. But that was one thing that Freedom Unite had over the other Monster Hunter games for gunning. And I experienced it, and it was pretty mad, to be honest. It's a cool feature. Uh, I'm pretty sad to see, you know, the 5th gen auto reloader after you look at 2nd uh, gens. But, you know, I, I did it. I saw it. Alright, so I've talked a lot without also discussing the most important part about Monster Hunter, which is the monsters, duh. And, uh, yeah, they suck. I mean, not all of them, but a lot of them do. Like, I get it. It's second gen, it's an older game, the AI is stiff, the movesets are limited. I get it, it's clunky, that's the thing. But that's why I don't understand why people talk so highly about Freedom Unite. Like, it's nostalgia goggles. Like, I'm not saying the game's bad. Especially for, you know, it was when it was made, like, 15 years ago or something. I don't know, it's been a long time, 13 years. I'm sure it was, like, fucking, like, a miracle with the game being like 700 megs or something. It's crazy how much they pack in this game. Well, like, every monster has the same three attacks and a roar, and that is pretty much it. And I think in G rank they have four attacks. But like 90% of this game is a roar, and then a charge while your roar is stunned. Smaller monsters like Kukku and Gypsros obviously don't have a roar, so yay. And I don't really mind those, they're pretty easy to deal with, but the AI leaves a lot to be desired even there. They can't aim like any of their fireballs or poison spits, so they just go in the exact same spot two feet in front of them. So if you're pretty much like away from the monster, they'll just stand there and puke up globs like three times in a row, and it feels super artificial. But yeah, speaking of charges though, I hate second gen charges. Uh, I've been hit by a lot of them, and I realize that they're fundamentally different than newer generation charges, like even third gen charges. Obviously, they have no wind-up animation, like monsters just look at you, and you have to expect to charge, and get out of the way, because you won't have time to react to a charge. That's pretty much standard for older games, but the charges here have huge hitbox. Like in newer titles, the hitboxes are pretty fair by comparison. Like when a Tigress charges you, if his arm goes over your head, there's a good chance you're not actually going to get hit. I mean, sometimes there's some weird jankiness. Same for a Cantor and a Conlos. But the hitboxes are so much bigger here in Freedom Unite. So like the wings from the monster have a hitbox from the floor all the way up to the top, and the charge boxes are like huge squares around the monster from like the maximum tips of the monster all the way around. So never assume, oh yeah, I'll clear that. No, 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 you're gonna get hit and you're gonna die. It's kind of hard to describe, but if you start looking at the hitboxes while you're playing, you'll understand. In fact, I might be able to like show like a little diagram here, I don't know. But anyway, lastly for the charges, they don't go in straight lines here. Pretty much every other monster in a game I've played had monsters like look at you, and then they would charge that direction. And of course, they would hit a wall and or an obstacle, they would kind of scoot up and down it, and that's kind of still deadly. But for the most part, they just go straight. Now, way back here in second gen though, they turn. Monsters will target you, and if you're trying to like run perpendicular to them, they will turn during their charge and catch you, which is obscenely scary. You have to Superman dive stuff. Like you can't just run away from monster charges. If a monster charges you from far enough out, there is a 100% chance that they will hit you unless you Superman dive. You can't be sprinting perpendicular to the charge of that direction. You can't be, you know, trying to, like, iframe it. That's not going to work. They're just going to get you. 
Like, I can't stress it enough. The charges in this game are 90% of the deaths for everybody, I'm sure. And this game is like 25% charges, so it's a big part of the game. Now, I really wanted to hammer in how much I hate small monsters and charges from large monsters, and those are my two biggest gripes of this game. With that out of the way, though, let me semi-briefly talk about all the monsters that I thought were great and bad, and just kind of give my impressions of them here in Freedom Unite. So, raptors. They're the same, nothing special here. Birds are cool. I like the cut coos a lot. Garuga is annoying, but that's normal for him. But he does have some unique moves here in second gen that I've not seen before. Where he does like a two-part beak slam, like he'll like flick up and then smash down and then charge into it or tail flip out of it. It's pretty cool. G-Rank Garuga, absolutely terrifying again for the usual, so I can't blame it too much. But I wanted to point out that Garuga seems to be much more enjoyable in the later generations, which is scary because I'm still terrified of fourth gen Garuga. But it's always an interesting monster to see in different games because it behaves a little bit differently. Speaking of birds though, Hypno Cockatrice. This is a frontier monster that I've never fought before, and I gotta say, it's a pretty good fight. It's not quite as aggressive as a Garuga, but it can be pretty fast, and the large sleeping gas it has can be spewed out in different directions and in different distances, so the pattern's not always the same like Cuckoos and Gypsaros. And I kinda wish we got him in future titles, because it's a fun turkey. Anyway, moving on. Blows Family. Here in Freedom Unite, like for you, we have both Monobloses and Diablos and their subspecies White and Black. I honestly can't tell much of a difference in their movesets though. They all kind of act the same, all four of them, and I don't understand the differences. I don't know, maybe that's just me. They charge, they tail swipe, they dig, they charge, you know, whatever. Black Diablos can change directions with his burrow attack, and that's about it. Like, 4th gen Monoblos and Diablos were pretty different, like with their movesets, and Monoblos used its horn a lot more and ran around a ton, so it's different there, but here in Freedom Unite, eh, not really seeing the differences, not really thrilled about these. It's kind of fun to cheese them by spending pellets underground, but they're not super special or unique in my opinion. I prefer the 4th gen versions. Wrath Family... I mean, until 5th gen, these really haven't changed at all, and I wasn't expecting them here obviously this far back. Lowe's still has his claws that instantly stun and poison you, and that's cancer of course, but it feels a lot more manageable here in Freedom Unite compared to like 3U, because, I mean, Lowe stays in the air for way more than he did before, but he's also like at higher elevations, so that stuff like doesn't hit you like ever and half of his attacks lead him into the air, and then half of those air attacks don't hit players at all. And he loves to fly around the map and do like three circles before diving onto you for every single attack, and he just wastes a lot of flipping time. He's not hard to deal with as a gunner most of the time, because he doesn't really aim his fireballs and doesn't hit you with much, but I can imagine Blade Masters is just like an awful fight to deal with. Rathians are more or less the same as they've always been. The only thing I really wanted to note about the Rathians was that because of the way charges work here, if Rathian does back-to-back -back charges across the map, you better be ready to sheath and Superman dive because she will turn and get you. And it can be very, very scary, especially in G-Rank and Goldian. Also, Rathian's AI is kind of weird in this game. Like, if you're a gunner and at medium distance, she will just sit there and spam fireballs constantly, like 9 to 10 times in a row. Really weird. So... Don't really like that, but, you know, Rathian's Rathian, whatever. Tigrix. Um, yeah, I hate Tigrix. I've always hated Tigrix. It's literally a lawnmower. And again, because of how charges work on Freedom Unite, it makes him so much more dangerous. He is the hardest monster in this game, for sure. This is one of those monsters where I have to swap the bow for some mobility. Like, there is no safe spot against Tigrix that I can see, unless you have earplugs or something. Because if you're far away, those charges will get to you. Like I've said, they turn. They will turn. You can't avoid these without Superman diving. If you're at medium range, you have to be super careful as Tigrix can jump backwards, which puts you at a bad spot because now you're at long range. But he can also roar at medium range, and if he does that, and he gets you with the roar, he's going to charge and kill you. So she's a gunner, you have no defense, he's going to one-tap you. You can get away from the roar if you're quick enough or just have a favorable position, but you have to be on your toes all the time at medium range. And I say medium is like 1-6 to six feet away from the monster. Now at close range, where you're basically on the Tigrix, stop being there. Tigrix turns and that'll knock you down on your butt, and if you get knocked down and he decides to charge, well you guessed it, you're dead. Look, Tigrix is scary. He always has been to me. I don't like Tigrix. But in Free of Unite, Tigrix is just not very fun for me. I would rather fight any monster in the game than Tigrix. Like, I just don't see how he could be a fan favorite, especially because he started in second gen. It's crazy. Like, there are better lawnmowers out there, like the Blows family. Fight those. And it's scary to think that I would rather fight Lunastra and stuff than Tigrix. Like, if you said that in 5th gen, people would look at you like you're crazy. But yeah, 
Hygrix is terrifying in Freedom Unite. Uh, okay, Plesioth. I know the infamous broken hip check hitbox is like from Green Plesioth here in Freedom Unite, and I can say that yes, I do see where the issue is. Like the charge hitboxes, the hip check seems to just put a big boxer on the monster and all of its tips, and then just calls that the hip check hitbox. Like you're gonna get hit if you're anywhere near a monster, and because like Plesioth has fins that stick out like all the way, like. It's not even the body that touches you, like, it's something else, like, the air is just gonna kill you because of that. Now, as a gunner, I didn't get hit too many times by the hip check. I, I mean, I did a few times and had a good chuckle at it, like, ah, there it is. But it's just so fitting. Uh, I didn't really have much else to say about Plesioth. They're big, they're kind of annoying when they just sit in the water, but Sonic Bombs exist, so it's mostly fine. I will say, though, that G-Rank Green Plesioth in the jungle was pure cancer, not because of the fish, but in both spots you fight it, they're tiny zones, and like one of the zones has like four, like four Vespoids that just harass the shit out of you the entire time, and the other zone is like three low prey and two Vespoids, and they're constantly harassing you. Dude, small monsters, man, they're just the worst. While I'm here though, let's talk about fucking Lava Seoth, the other frontier monster Capcom loves. This fucking fish. Almost as bad as Tigrix. Fish Scoot is terrible. That's the attack where like Piscean Wyverns and Leviathans will just throw their body on the ground and just slither across the zone at you. Uh, they scoot up and down the map, change directions, pivot on a dime, slide up walls, it's just oppressive. And Lava Seoth has that like Lava Rock Spit attack that has better aim than a Major League Baseball player, and the hitbox the size of Blood Seoth's hip check. I found the safest place to be was actually just like in front of his face, because you could just get away from it at the last second if you just run to the side and that can also avoid the scoot. But that took me a little while to learn. Lava Seoth also likes to waste huge amounts of time and constantly scoot towards the back of the zone, like I think it's zone 10, where he dives into the lava and does like three rock throws before jumping back out. And then of course, he just scoots right back in, rinse and repeat, and no joke, like 10 minutes of him doing that, it's just the same two things over and over again. The AI is atrocious. And again, I get it, old game, but it doesn't mean I have to defend it now. Fish out of the way, and I want to specifically talk about the Fang Beasts, or whatever the monkeys are called here. I think they're still Fang Beasts. I hate Ice Monsters, so Baganga can just go fuck right off. But Copper Baganga is a sick fight. It's really fast, like really fast. And he throws rocks and burrows and has a lot of like quick jabs. It feels more like a Rajang than a Baganga. And even as a heavy bow gun user, I found this fight to be super fun to dodge through. Like, if you took Rajang and just made it a little bit smaller and gave it rock attacks instead of lightning, and actually, I, I guess Rajang does have rock attacks in later generations, but Copper did it first. You get the point, though. Copper is just like a little Rajang, and I think it's awesome, and I love it. Speaking of Rajang, though, Rajang's here. He's always been a great fight, and even here in Freedom Unite, stands true. He's fast, he's got good openings, very scary when you get hit. But I didn't notice anything super special about his moveset, seemed to be much more random than 4th gen, but he didn't have any like of the moves I hadn't seen before, but he does spam like his charge attacks a lot more, which is par for the course of 2nd gen I guess, and he doesn't have triple Blanca Ball, which kinda sucks. Still fun though, I don't have anything negative to say about the monkeys here, I approve, Fang Beasts are good. And then we have the Crabs, um, I always like the Crabs, Daimyo and Plum Hermitor are some fun monsters, especially in low rank and even G rank. They have solid gunner weapons, and in general, can't say too many bad things about them. In 2nd gen though, the crabs don't walk with like their water gun attack, which always was scary to me, but otherwise they behave pretty much the same in 2nd gen as they do like in 4th. Shoguns though, these guys are real menaces, at least for gunners, I'm not sure how blade masters feel about them. They, their attacks have deceptively large range, and they move very quick when they want to. I can't say I dislike shoguns, but they are extremely tough. Like. I don't ever feel like, oh, that hitbox is unfair, or the monster has no openings, because that's not true. They just don't take that much damage from ranged attacks in general, and pretty much everything two taps a gunner in G-Rank. So, of course they do as well, but with much faster attacks, and I just always feel like I'm pressured for positioning and ammo on them. Terror Shogun, actually found to be easier to manage, as he has like the Black Gravio Skull, and so his shell is super weak to water element, which actually gives him a decent hit zone. And he can you know, shoot water out of it if you're behind him, and it's pretty easy to dodge, and you can bait that out a lot. So, Terra Shogun, pretty okay. But regular Shogun, oh my gosh, that guy is scary. I think I died to him way more than Terra. Overall though, pretty respectful towards the Shoguns. No hate, just concerned for my life. Uh, and actually don't have too much to say about like Elder Dragons. I didn't really fight them much, as I didn't need to for quests, and I didn't really need their gear. Uh, I do have some general thoughts about them, besides what I mentioned before. The fights are long, as I've said, but Luna and Teo are still very enjoyable here, and I'd rather fight Lunastra than a Tigrix, which again would have been pretty blasphemous to say. 
but that's pretty true here in Pretty Me Night. Kieran is fast and melts the pellets because Kieran has good gunner hit zones across the head and horns, which it actually has magnets too, which is very nice and forgiving for us gunners. Camellios is actually super cool because he actually fights while being cloaked. He's not just using it to like reposition. And rather than him being poison, he actually does corrosion stuff like defense down on hit, which makes the trinity of elders between Teo, Kami, and Kush make way more sense. As Kush is metal and rusts, and so Camellius does acid to defense down to break down Kushala rather than poison because poison for some reason. Not really sure why they changed Camellius to be honest. I like him a lot more in second gen. I think his attack patterns are pretty good, and I think he's interesting. Um, Yamasukami, an elder. Uh, that's a weird fight. That mouth is really scary, like terrifyingly scary, like Elder Tor is scary. A lot more scarier than I would have imagined. I do wish he does come back though. It's a very unique monster, and I think if he wasn't confined to like a single spot in the tower and had like free range in his zone to fight, that could really spice it up to a super cool fight. Yamatsukami is cool. A Cantor, same as like 4th gen, but wow, I hate the map more than him. There's like a zigzag of lava rivers that you can't walk through, but of course he can. So there's a lot of choke points on his map and not very much space to maneuver him. So pretty much whenever he decided to charge, yeah, I was going to get hit. I ended up face tanking like all the charges for the most part. Ukonlos, way too much life to deal with solo. I think I fought that thing like for 25 minutes and ran out of ammo like four times. And I think on the fifth time I finally managed to kill him. Like, I think he's got like 18,000 life in G rank hub. And for reference, like a G3 Rathalos or G2 Rathalos has like 6,000. So he's got a lot of life. And his hit zones aren't exactly the best. So that guy, not scary fight, pretty easy to dodge. Pretty much the same as for you. Zarina's fine, but oh my gosh, so much life. Okay, that's pretty much all I have to say about the monsters. Some good, some bad. Um, I didn't go over everything, obviously, but that's stuff that kind of stood out. All right, so one of the other things that stands out a lot for Pretty Me Night for me is the maps. There is a lot of maps in this game, like three or four different forests, deserts, mountains, jungles, swamps, you name it. I guess it comes from like the old season changes in the previous game. I'm not really sure, to be honest, but they're all here now. And it just feels like to me that there's a ton of maps. And I think that's pretty cool. I never really took the map items with me. And since I'd never played on most of these maps before, I was having to discover all the zones for myself. And I don't think I ever even got super familiar with them to know where each zone led to and where the monsters would move to. So, again, spent a lot of time running around, wasting my time. Not only are there a lot of maps, though, but for the most part, they're pretty gorgeous. Like, in 5th gen, outside the map confines, like, the skybox in the background are super flat and boring. And there's not a whole lot going on. But in these older games, like 2nd and 3rd gen, there's a lot of terrain and foliage in the skybox and the backgrounds. And there's, like, some monsters and stuff back there and, like, little things moving around. So the maps feel a lot bigger than the confines of the small zones that you're in. It's actually really impressive. And I, you know, going back and looking at like rise maps, which I like rise maps, but outside of like the pre-designated zones, like all the areas in between, there's like nothing going on and it's kind of boring. And like the skybox around the map is really boring. It's flat and there's just, ugh. like dude, older maps, they knew what they were doing there. And okay, so looking at the wiki, there's like, 15 maps it looks like in Freedom Unite, if you don't include the single zone maps like Arenas and some of the Elder Dragon spots, where for you has like 8 maps if you don't count again the single battle arena maps. But it does have the Everwoods, so you can count that as like 2 I suppose. So it's like 10 maps to manage. And there's actually a lot of maps here, and for being such an old game, again it's just impressive. And I want more maps. Sure, 5th gen maps are bigger, and I mean I really like world maps too, but there's only like 5 of them. So I hope Wilds, you know, is going to have a lot more biomes and more variety into the terrain and swamps, icy mountains, volcanoes, jungles, deserts, water areas, grasslands. Like, I want it all. I don't want to have, like, four different biomes again. Like, I want more maps. I think that's one of the things that really breathes a lot of life into the game. Okay, so I think I pretty much touched up on every aspect of Freedom Unite from a gunner's perspective. Uh, let's go ahead and do a quick summary for the game now that I'm done. Okay, so I can see where older Monster Hunter players are coming from. There's a ton of content packed here in Freedom Unite, and for its time, 15 years ago, I'm sure this game was absolutely mind-blowing. I had a mostly great time going through it for like, you know, my first experience with this second gen game. That being said, second gen Monster Hunter is pretty dated. There's a lot more jank than I expected, to be honest. Like, I knew the hitboxes would be worse, but, you know, they're pretty much bad all the time. The Monster AI is also a significant step down even when compared to third gen. And by that, I mean monsters have just a very limited move pool, will often repeat the same attacks over and over again, and just kind of behave kind of weird. 
like even if the player isn't in view of attacks they just kind of repeat stuff and it's just yeah like it feels a lot less natural when a monster is looking away from you and then charges against a random wall so looking at free to be night through a modern day lens i have to ask myself if this game actually offers anything over other monster hunter titles like give me a reason to play it over let's say third or fourth gen or some other generation of games like third gen we have underwater combat that's unique. Fourth gen, you have the Wycoon Trader, you have Apex Monsters, you have Guild Quests and Everwood stuff. Like, that's different and unique. You also have two new weapons. Uh, GU has, like, Arts and Styles, or fifth gen, which is, you know, that's his whole thing. And then you have to ask, okay, is there a reason to go back and play Freedom Unite? And honestly, I can't really see anything that's extremely unique to Freedom Unite. Sure, it's got a few monsters we haven't seen in a long time, like Hypnococatrice or Copper Blaganga and Yamatsukami and Shen Georen. But would I play through the game just for those? Or recommend someone play Freedom Unite because of that? And honestly, I can't say I would. Sure, it's a good Monster Hunter game. I mean, all Monster Hunter games are good, except the first one. But it is a product of its time. I think second gen is a little too old for most people, and I don't think it offers enough to warrant to go back and play. And so, like, yes, it's a cool experience, but I don't feel like most people will have anything to gain from going back here. So I finished Freedom Night. I did all the hub stuff solo. I didn't finish G-Rank Fatalis Quest because I just, I, wa I didn't want to do it anymore. By the time I was done with hub, I was pretty much done with the game. So I'm going to check it off that I've completed it. I've done all of Village and all of up through G3 hub. And I did have some good experience there. There are definitely some good fights that I'll remember. But it's not an amazing title that I was expecting. I think people just have to clean off their nostalgia goggles a little bit. I definitely won't be going back to first gen Monster Hunter, that's for damn sure. This will probably be as far back as I go. Um, but yeah, I think next it for me is going back to For You before Wilds comes out. But uh, yeah, that's going to be all for me. Thank you all for watching. I know it's kind of like an overly long review of Freedom Unite. Uh, but yeah, if anyone wants to talk shop about Monster Hunter or gaming in general, feel free to join my Discord in the description below. But uh, yeah, peace and good luck out there, hunters.